Hello friends, Pastor Charlie here. I'm so glad you clicked on this video. I pray your life will be impacted by this word. Enjoy the service. Today is a special day. We are having what we call our youth takeover. So you're welcome to our youth service. So you, you, I, know, I know a lot of you guys don't make it out to our youth service. So we wanted to bring the youth service to you this morning. And uh, man, we're having a great time. Can we give it up to our worship team? Didn't they do a phenomenal job this morning? I want to I wanna thank, uh, first of all, our pastors, Pastor Charlie and Carla, uh, you know, just for allowing us to uh, have this service on a Sunday morning and bring it out. They really, really believe in the young people. Uh, they themselves were youth pastors at a time, and so they believe in this generation, and we are just so glad to have them and support us. Um, and so they're out of town. They're, uh, you know, doing some ministry work, and we just, uh, uh, wherever they are, we want to say, if you're watching, thank you so much for believing in the youth. Um, you know, one of the things that we believe in Vital Church, the youth are not just the youth of the future. They're the church of now. Uh, they're working now. God is working in their life now, right now. And we've seen growth throughout the years. We've seen uh, the young people just continue to grow and challenge, be challenged. They bring friends. Their friends get saved. And, and we've seen a growth uh, in the youth ministry. I also want to thank my wife. I, she's out there somewhere. She's, uh, I've said it before. She's the two by four. You don't see her, but she, you know, makes everything stand. Uh, you know, she's working out there. Um, and I just want to thank her because she's a huge part of our ministry. I also want to thank our, our leaders, uh, Isaac and Alyssa here. They're uh, helping us in the Mid Valley. They're here today with the youth. Uh, we also have Isaac and Gwen, who right now they're out. They just had a baby. Uh, and so they're watching from home, and we love them. Um, we also have Dama and Ram. They're, Ram is on the lights. Dama's somewhere back over here. And they help us with our young adults. Um, and then I just want to thank all the coaches that help in tribes throughout the year. We have a, a ton of coaches that help us in small groups. Uh, they do a phenomenal job. Let's give it up for them. It's definitely not something me and my wife could do by ourselves. It takes a whole team uh, to impact a generation. And, and uh, I'm just so blessed for the team that God has given us. And so if parents, if you're here, if you have not brought your young people to one of the youth services, man, they are missing out. Get them here. And, uh, and I believe that God's going to do a work in their life. As a matter of fact, that's a little bit of what I want to talk about today, this morning. And I want to dive in straight into the message because I want to share something so important with you today. But I want to start with a question. I always try to do that. Um, anybody ever been uh, here a victim of identity theft? Uh, if you have, like, just, you know, kind of wave at me, identity theft. Okay, there's, there's some, some people that have been a victim of identity theft. And if you have, you know how frustrating it is, you know, to have somebody take your identity. It's, it's uh, you know, it's annoying, it's frustrating, and it's time-consuming because you spend a lot of time trying to recover your identity, right? Somebody's using, you know, your social, your license, your life, right? And, it's, and, and here you are left trying to fix you know, and recover your identity. You have to file a police report. You have to contact your DMV. You have to contact social security services. You have to contact the passport division. You have to contact your bank, your creditors, et cetera, et cetera. And you're just trying to recover, again, your identity. Someone is living their life with your name, with your social security, with your credit. Sometimes it's better, right? They actually make it better, make our credit better. We're like, you know what? I'm okay. <laughs> but somebody is living your identity, and you're trying to recover it. And you're left to struggle. For some, sometimes your credit is out of order. Sometimes your taxes are out of order. You might even get pulled over and arrested for something you didn't do, especially if you have a common name, right? If, if, you know, if you're Juan Lopez, I don't know if there's a Juan Lopez here, but it's a common name, you know, you might get pulled over. And identity theft is a, is a real issue. I mean, it happens a lot. Every year, over 9 million uh, identities are stolen. Over 9 million, I want you to think about that. 9 million identities stolen. 
and over $43 billion lost because of identity theft. I want to tell you, there is definitely a fight for your identity. There is a fight, physical fight, for your identity. In 2004, a man was found unconscious. He had been beaten and left naked without any identification next to a dumpster behind a Burger King in Richmond Hill, Georgia. When he woke up in the hospital, he did not remember who he was. He had what they called a severe case of amnesia. And for the next 11 years, between 2004 and 2015, neither he or the doctors could determine his identity or his background. They could not determine his name, his age, where he lived, if he had family, if he had a job. They ran it through the system, through the, the state system, the local system, the national system, fingerprints, DNA, everything, and nothing. They could not find who this man was for 11 years. No one had an idea who this man was. They did, um, despite searching for relatives, uh, they did TV commercials, TV shows. He came out on Dr. Phil. Dr. Phil hired a private investigator and nothing. They put him on the radio. They plastered his face all over the state of Georgia. And not a single relative, a single friend, or an acquaintance ever came forward in 11 years. He became known as Benjamin Kyle because he was found behind the BK, Burger King. They gave him Benjamin Kyle, like a pseudonym. And that's how he lived his life. So I want you to think for us. I, I, was look, I was reading this story and I was thinking about this man. Because can you imagine being this man? Someone assaults you, beats you down, leaves you naked, takes everything from you, leaves you unconscious. All of a sudden you wake up and you have no clue who you are. No clue who you are. Nobody comes forward. Maybe, maybe you had a family. Maybe you have, you know, some family somewhere. Maybe you had an important job. Maybe, you know, there, there was a life that you have previous to this, but you have no idea. And now you're living life with a pseudonym. For those that don't know, a pseudonym is a false name that is given to you or you, you take on. A, you know, a, a, and, and I want to tell you that because a lot of people don't know who they are. You live life with a pseudonym and you don't know who you are. So in the same way... For a lot of us, life has beat us down. We have been left empty. And because of the hits of life, we have lost our identity along the way. We have what we call spiritual amnesia. We have forgotten who we are. I mean, life will come, bring hits, and you adjust to the hits. You know, it, it, you, you go through a difficult time in your life and you adjust through to those difficult times in your life. And over a period of time, over years, you adjust to your surroundings, to your circumstance. Because we feel nothing's ever going to change. And if things are not going to change, I might, I might as well adapt to the circumstance that I'm in. And we take on a pseudonym. We take a name that doesn't belong to us and we start living this life adjusted to this world. And can I tell you, there is a lot of people that have adjusted to this world. As a youth pastor, one of the things that I see in young people, and probably the biggest thing is that they have no idea who they are. So they go through times of anxiety. They go through times of depression. Why? Because here they are trying to fit in, be something that they're not. They're trying to do things that they would normally not do. Parents, you, you might think, like, I never taught my child like that. I never raised them up like that. How, why are they doing these things? And, and they're doing them a lot of the times because they're just trying to be what everybody else wants them to be. And they have lost their identity. And as I was thinking about young people, I couldn't think about, you know, forget to think about adults. Because adults, we disguise it a little bit better. But we are in the same boat. We have no idea who we are. And we start adjusting to the circumstance around us. God called us. He gave us a purpose, an identity. He's the one that created you. He says who you are. Can I tell you the goal of the enemy is that, to steal 
your identity. He wants to steal who God created you to be. Look what John 10.10 10 says. The thief's purpose is to what? He's talking about the enemy, talking about Satan. The thief's purpose is to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus says, but my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. How do you get that rich and satisfying life when you know who you are? The thief has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. He wants to steal your identity. He wants to destroy your life. He wants to kill your purpose. But Jesus says, I've come to give you a rich and a satisfying life. But it all comes by knowing the truth of who you are. That's why the word tells us you will know the truth and it will set you free. We got to understand who we are. See, if Satan can get you to forget who you are, then you will forget about your purposes and your destiny. If he can get you to forget that we are here on earth, but for a short time. That our home is not here, but is up with him. That our, our, our residence, our, our citizenship is heaven, not this earth. That we are just here for a short time. If Satan can get you to forget that and to think that all there is is this world, this job, this circumstance, this moment. If he could get you to that moment, you'll forget about your purpose and your destiny. Look what Alyssa J. Howard says. Our identity is found when we stop being who we are and start, and start becoming who we were created to be. Stop being who you are now and start living who God created you to be. Can I tell you it's special? Who God created you to be is special. And there is purpose in who God created you to be. So to recover our identity, First, we need to know that we are, number one, a new person. For all of us that have received Christ, and you, you've, if you've been to church, you've heard us every time at the end of service, we, we make an invitation. If you want to accept Christ in your heart, if you want to make him the Lord and Savior of your life, you get an opportunity to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. What the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a what? A new person. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. When you come to Christ, when you make him the Lord and Savior of your life, you are a new person. I want you to tell your neighbor, I am a new person. I am a new person. That old person is gone. That, that old sinner, that old person is God. I am a new person, person. And this is a powerful verse because it reminds us that no matter what we've done, who we've been in the past, we can start over when we come to Christ. No matter what you've done, no matter what your sin is, no matter what your past looks like, no matter where you come from, no matter what your family, you know, what family you come from, no matter the past, you can come to Christ, and he can make you a brand new person, a new person. See, the shame is gone when you come to Christ. The guilt is gone. The rejection is gone. And a new life begins in Christ. You don't have to live the way you're living. He wants to forgive you. He wants to cleanse you. He wants to give you new life. That is who Jesus created you to be. It is because Christ paid the price for our sins that he now gives us a new beginning. It is not something that we could have done or earned. There is nothing we could do to earn it, salvation. It's, there is nothing we could do. It is a gift of God. Jesus went to the cross. He was crucified on there. And because he shed his blood for us, now we can have new life. It's a gift. Talking about Christmas. I know we're getting ready to buy gifts or some of you guys have already... Bought and gifts, you, you took advantage of Black Friday and bought all these gifts. The most special gift that you can attain this, this, this year is salvation, is the love of Jesus Christ. But let me tell you something. But becoming a new person in Christ is not merely about adopting new habits or behaviors. But it's about experiencing a fundamental shift 
in our identity. It's not just, by, uh, you know, if, if you used to drink and say, well, I'm not going to drink anymore. You know, if you used to do this sin, well, I'm not going to do that sin anymore. Those things are good. But it's not just about saying no. It's about starting living a new identity. It's about understanding what Christ did for you. And he's saying, this is who you are now. And you start living that new identity. And it's because we start living that new identity that we start saying no to these things. It's an, over, it's an outflow of our identity. We don't say no to things or sinful things just because we want God to love us more. God has already loved you. All he's going to love you. We say no to things. We abstain from things because he loved us. Because he is good. We are who God says that we are. Your, your, your co-workers don't get to decide who you are. Your boss doesn't get to decide who you are. Your circumstance doesn't get to decide who you are. Your, your background doesn't get to decide who you are. You are who God says that you are. I love this quote by A.W. Tozer. He says, the most important thing about a man is not what he does, but who he is. It's not what he does, but who he is. I know we have a lot of people, a lot of professional people, a lot of people, you know, most of you guys have jobs. And if we spend eight hours, 12 hours in the job, it's easy to identify ourselves to that. Because we're there for such a long time that we start thinking that's who we are. Oh, I'm just a banker. Oh, I, I, you know, I'm a real estate agent. Oh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a teacher. Oh, I'm this, I'm that. And we start identifying ourselves by the thing that we do. Can I tell you that is not who you are? You are a child of God that happens to be a teacher. You're a child of God that works as a banker. You are a child of God that is a mom, that is a dad. You're a child of God that is a student. You're a child of God that is an athlete. You are a child of God. This is who you are. All of the other things is what we do. But it's not who we are. Don't take identity in the things that you do. As a matter of fact, use them as a platform. Use them as a platform to be who you are. I remember when I, when I was working in my previous job, there was days that I just hated going. Anybody ever hate going to work? You know, you have to wake up early in the morning, right? And you're thinking about who you're going to go work with and who your boss is and coworkers and clients and stuff like that. And you're dreading it. I mean, you're just dreading it. You're hitting the alarm four or five times hoping that, you know, it just <laughs> it doesn't turn on anymore. And you, you're just dreading going to work. And finally you get there and you start living everything that you were dreading. I remember going to my job and I just dreaded it, you know. I, I just, I didn't want to be there. But hey, it was a check at the end of the week. I was literally working for the check. I was not working because I loved my job. And I, I know there's people that can relate. And I, I remember, you know, one day I was, I was going home and, and I was talking to God and I said, God, can you just get me another job? Like, I'm tired of this one. I'm tired of this job. I'm tired of the, the people I work with. I, I'm, I'm tired of, you know, having to deal with people, right? I, I'm tired. Can you get me another job? I remember that, you know, the Holy Spirit just kind of slapped me. Anybody ever been slapped by the Holy Spirit? And he tells me, he tells me, you're looking at this the wrong way. See, your job is not your identity. It's your platform. You've got to look, start looking at people. You've got to start looking at people as the people that you're ministering to. This is your congregation. You're the pastor and they're your congregation. And I'm like... But, but, but I do that over there. Why can't you do it over here? I remember that changed my perspective. That changed my mentality. It flipped a switch in my mind. And I said, God, let me look at people the way you see them. Let me look at them through your lenses. Let, let me look at them through your heart. And I remember the next day I walked into my job and I started looking at people. The people that annoyed me already, right, that at once I didn't want to be next to. And I started, you know, I would go to them and I say, like, God, let me see them through your eyes. And all of a sudden, I, didn't, I stopped hearing the complaining and I, stopped, I started to hear what was going on in their life. I started to understand why they were like that. 
I, under, I started to understand the situation that was happening in their home and how their daughter had been sick all night and they didn't, they didn't get enough sleep and therefore they're a little cranky this morning. I started to see that, you know, that they, were, they had hurts, they were separated, they, they, you know, they had, bad, you know, um, a situation that was hurting with, the, with their parents and so on and so forth. I started seeing deeper than just what was on the surface. Can I tell you, when you start looking at people through God's eyes, you start looking deeper than just the surface. Because what we're annoyed with is the surface. We're annoyed with the things that we see, but we don't want to look deeper to see why they're reacting the way they're reacting. And God started to change my heart. I started to realize I'm a child of God. My identity is I'm a new person, and I'm a child of God. And my job, my job, this is, this is my church. This is the congregation, and I'm going to love on them, and I'm going to pray for them, and I'm going to be there for them. And it changed everything. You're a child of God. You are a child of God. Look at John 1.12. It says, but to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave them the right to become children of God. That's you. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're a child of God. And as a child of God, our identity is not found in the things that we do, but in what Christ has already done for us. So when we find our identity in Christ and realize that we are a new person, that leads me to point number two. Now we need a transformed mind. Because, come on, we, 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 we might say the prayer. Say, Jesus, I need you. I, make you. I make you my Lord and I make you my Savior. But that doesn't change our, our thinking thinking. And we need a transformed mind. To recover our identity, we need to renew our minds. We need to expel the toxic hurtful and misguided thoughts that we live by we we need to expel those things from our lives because to live the life that God wants us to live and to accomplish his purposes we need to change the way we think we have to change the way we think we have to change our thinking thinking look what Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says it says don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. That's your identity. Don't copy the world. Right? You have a new identity. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. You want to be a new person? Change the way you think. Christ has given you an identity. Right? When he, when he died for us. He gave us his identity. He says, I make you a new person. But to change your mind... To be transformed, you need to change the way you think. I love this because um, transformation comes by changing the way we think. There are so many people that have accepted Jesus Christ. They've, they've, they've believed in their heart. They've said the prayer. But ha there has been no transformation in their life because they have not allowed God to change the way they think. And transformation comes by changing the way we think. I love how the message, so there, there's a, 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 this version called the message, which is like a paraphrase of the Bible. And I want to read it to you because this is the way Romans 12, 2 says it in the message. It says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit in without even thinking. Anybody ever fit in without even thinking? Instead, fix your attention on God and you'll be changed from the inside out. You'll be changed from the inside out. Don't become so well adjusted to this culture that you fit in without even thinking about it. I always tell this to the young people. I mean, some of them are trying so hard to be liked by, by their peers, by their friends, that all of a sudden you fit in without even thinking about it. And you become what everybody else wants you to become. And you lose your identity. You lose your identity. Our thoughts have a profound impact on our behavior, on the things we do. Our thoughts dictate what we do, literally. 
right? Our thoughts dictate. If we believe something about ourselves, then we do those things because we believe those things about ourselves. But if we change those things that we think about ourselves and we start changing them with what God says about us, then we start doing what we know about ourselves. That's why thoughts are so powerful. That's why your mind is so powerful. When we renew our minds, we're not just changing our thoughts. We are literally changing our lives. When you, uh, let me say that again. When we, when we change our thoughts, we literally change our lives. We change who we are. Pastor Craig Rochelle from Life Church has a book out. It's called The Winning, Winning the War. I'm sorry, Winning the War in Your Mind. I recommend it highly. And he says in that book, it says, change your thinking and change your life. He goes on to say, our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. Who you are today is a result of the thoughts in your past. Who you become in the future will reflect what you think about today. So it's time to change your thinking so God can change your life. Change your thinking. I'll be... Find that transformation by allowing God to change your thinking. If we align our thinking to God's word and direction, we can experience true transformation. You can start walking in a real bona fide transformation of your life. So real three, three quick things if you want to change your mind, if you want to renew your mind. Number one, recognize the need for change. If you want to change your mind, recognize your need for change. So the first step is to acknowledge that our minds have been shaped by the values and perspectives of this world. You got to understand that. The world will often glorifies negativity, pessimism, and comparison. And this leads to a distorted perception of reality. Anybody ever seen a truck that says, my wife is toxic? Hijos tóxicos. Esposa tóxica. Esposo tóxico. And we, we laugh at that like, <laughs> they're toxic. But we almost to a certain extent glorify that. I mean, I've seen, you know, people say, I'm looking for a toxic girlfriend. I'm looking for a toxic boyfriend. And we glorify this as a good thing. But again, these thoughts are not from God. They're from the world. But a lot of us have adopted that mentality. And so when we have those kind of thoughts, we need to realize we need transformation in our life. We need to change our thoughts. We need to change those things. So we need to recognize the need for a change. Because God has called us to break free from these harmful patterns and embrace, embrace a new mindset. Number two, we need to saturate our mind with God's word. If you want to change your mind, you got to saturate yourself with God's word. you got to get in the word. you got to read the word. Because that's what's going to challenge those thoughts that are in there. And sometimes we don't even realize that our thoughts need to change until we come in, come in confrontation with the word. We did a whole series, um, you know, some time back, in, and we called it, Jesus said what? It was like a question. Because some of the things that Jesus said were tough. So when we confront what Jesus said and, co and, and compare it to our lives, it's like, man, that's difficult. My mind really needs to change. My thought really needs to change. We, we, we really need a change in our lives. So you need to saturate yourself with God wor God's word. The Bible is the primary tool for renewing our minds. By immersing ourselves in scripture, we allow God's truth to penetrate our hearts and our minds. And it challenges the old ways of thinking. And it aligns us to his perspective. His new perspective that he has in our life. Can I tell you this process requires for you to be intentional. And to do it every single day. Read the word. Read the word. Do it intentional. It requires discipline. Because again the word of God will challenge those ingrained patterns and thoughts in our life. And number three. See community and accountability. It, it, when, when you're trying to change your thoughts, you need people to keep you accountable. You need people in your life to do life, to do life with and to keep you accountable. And I love this because once we start changing our thoughts and we live a transformed life. I love what the second part of Romans 12.2 says. 
It says once you know who you are and you have a transformed mind, verse, verse 12 too, it says then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, it's pleasing, and perfect. A lot of us are still wondering what we're here on earth to do. God, I don't know what I'm here to do. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Can I tell you? The Bible tells us why. We have not allowed God to transform our mind with his word. It says there, when we are transformed by his word, then, then you will know God's will for your life, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. It's a good thing. You will know the will of God for your life. And to live out your new identity, once you know who you are and once you've been transformed of your mind, God's will for you is what we call purpose. He gives you purpose. That's point number three. And we're going to close out with this. So what is purpose? There's a lot of talk about purpose. But what is purpose? Well, purpose is the reason for which something was created, for, created or for which something exists. And there is purpose in each and every one of us because God created us on purpose for a purpose. You're not just here by happenstance. You're not just here walking because, you know, you were just born and you have no direction and you are whoever, you know, whatever you become. No, God has a purpose for your life. I want to read to you Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. It says, for we are God's handiwork. We're created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which, he, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are God's handiwork. We are his masterpiece. We are a work of art. In other words, God took his time creating you. You know, one of the things when I talk to young people... Is my first thing that I tell them is trying to explain to them who they are and bring identity. Everything that I've shared with you in a way that they understand. And I, I, I bring them that because a lot of the times that's what it is. They just don't know who they are. So I try to bring identity into their lives. I, I try to bring purpose into their life. I try to tell them you're not just here as a 7th grader, 8th grader, ninth grader, whatever. You're not just an athlete. You're, you're, there's purpose in your life. God created you with purpose. There's, there's something that God wants to do in your life. And you are God's handiwork. You are his masterpiece. As a matter of fact, God created you exactly the way he wanted you. I tell him, God could have placed you in any other timeline. God could have placed you with any other family. God could have placed you and made you any way he wanted but here you are, looking this way, living with this, in this family, living in this timeline, going to this school. That, my friend, is purpose. That's purpose. God has a job for you where you are. God has a job for you. He's got a purpose for you where you are. And God took his time creating you. You are his handiwork. We are God's creation crafted with love and purpose. The second part of that verse says we are created in Christ Jesus. And this emphasizes that our new identity in Christ is the foundation for the good works to begin. It says we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And good works is not to earn salvation as we previously said. Good works, again, it's an outflow of our identity in Christ. Now we do good works because of what Christ did for us. Because he loved us, now we love people. Because he forgave us, we forgive people. Because he came and he gave, we now give to people. It, it, is, it is an outflow of our identity. And then the last thing is, he, in this verse it says, that God prepared for us in advance to do. And here's the great thing about this. Good works are prepared in advance for us. God has not left us to figure out what good works to do. He has already prepared them before you were even born. That's purpose. 
He knew what you were going to do, and he, he was ready for that. Pastor Rick Warren, in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, by the way, we have a course that's going to come up uh, early next year sometime. And we're going to do a discipleship uh, based on the purpose driven life. Uh, and this time around, it's going to be in English. So I encourage you guys to join this uh, course. And it's, it's really d diving into what we're here to do, our purpose. But in his book, he says that there's basically five purposes for every Christian, every believer. Five purposes. Number one, we were created to worship God. If you want to know what your purpose is, here, are they, here they are. Number one, we're created to worship God. We're created to glorify Him and to bring Him honor. And we don't just do it by singing songs. We do it by living out the life, right? Living out our identity wherever we go. It's not just songs, but we live to worship God. Number two is fellowship. We were created to have relationships with God, to have relationship with God and have relationships with people. We're not meant to be alone. We're not meant to be by ourselves. Number three is evangelism. We were created to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. To share what he's done in our life. To pass it on to somebody. Hey, Jesus changed me. He transformed me. He gave me his new identity. Well, we take that to somebody else. Number four, discipleship. We were created to grow in our faith and become more like Christ. So we take on his identity, but we keep transforming our minds. We keep changing the way we think. That's discipleship. And number five is ministry. We were created to use our gifts and talents to serve others. Because every single one of you has a talent. Every single one of you has a gift. And God wants to use what he gave you to serve others. He wants you to bear fruit. And the fruit is never for the tree. The fruit is for people. It's so that the people can see the fruit and that they can grab the fruit and that they can use the fruit and they can be transformed by it. And I want to I wanna close out with this. This is a bonus. It's not one of my points, but I want to end here. It's important to know who you are. This world and so many things is trying to steal and pull at your identity. And it's important to know who you are. Because if you know who you are, then you know what to do. There's nothing greater than knowing who you are and being certain about who you are to understand what you need to do. What you need to do. See, our, our newfound identity leads us to clean house. If you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, he says, because of that decision, you are a new person. So our newfound identity leads us to clean house, to have a renewed mind, to, to, to clear all that junk and those thoughts that we have in our minds, to clean house. And then a renewed mind leads us to discern God's will for our lives. That's purpose. Because it, it is until we have a transformed mind, a renewed mind, that we now know the will of God for our lives. We know our purpose. And lastly, our purpose leads us to have heavenly perspective. And this is powerful. This is powerful because when you have perspective, when you know who you are, when your mind has been transformed, when you're walking in the will of God, when you're walking in your purpose, that gives you the fourth thing, perspective. There's a scripture in the Bible in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. This is Paul. And he says this. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say again, rejoice. That's beautiful, right? Put it on a sticker, put it on a shirt, put it on a mug. In the morning when you read that, you know, on, with a coffee and you're like, I should have a good day. But can I tell you the context of this verse? Paul was not drinking coffee. Paul was not opening a Christmas gift. Paul was not sitting around with his family having a good time. Paul was in prison writing this letter to the church of, the, of Philippi. He's in prison. He had been beaten down. He was shackled. Didn't know if he was going to eat. Didn't know if at any time they were going to come in and beat him and assault him again. He didn't know if they were going to come in and kill him this time. 
And in the middle of all that, he's writing this letter, and he tells the church, rejoice. Rejoice. Always rejoice. In the worst circumstance of his life, he says rejoice. Can I tell you? That's perspective. He knew who he was. He had a renewed mind. He was walking in the will of God. He had purpose. And because of that, that gave him perspective. Can I tell you, Jesus did the same thing. He, he came here after three years of ministry. They, they took him, arrested him. They put him on a cross. They beat him. They mocked him. They accused him. They said all of these things, the soldiers, as he's hanging on the cross, the soldiers are gambling for his clothes. And Jesus is hanging on the cross. And he looks down on them and says, Father, forgive them. For they don't, they don't know what they do. Perspective. When you know who you are, you know what to do. Perspective. And I, that's, why I, I, what, that's what I pray that we have. That we rise above the things that happen to us. That we rise above the things that are in our midst. Because we know who we are. That we're not shaken by circumstances. That we're not shaken by the things the enemy throws at us. Because we know that everything that the enemy throws our way, it's for our good. It's for our benefit. It, God will use it for our good. We rise above it. We have perspective. I know who I am. I know what I'm here to do. I know that I'm walking in the will of God. So I have perspective. I will not be shaken. I will not be moved. I will stand still and know that he is good and that the Lord is the Lord. That God is God. I will stand still. I'm going to ask you to stand, church. I pray that today, if you don't know Jesus... That you will make him the Lord and Savior of your life. Because everything starts there. Your new identity, your new life starts by knowing Jesus. Not by, by the things you can do, but what he already did. He wants to give you a new identity. He wants to give you a renewed mind. He wants you to start walking in the purpose and the things he created you for. So that when you face things in this world, you have perspective. That you know who you are. So today I want to sing. And I just want to say, God, no matter what comes our way. If I have breath in my lungs, I will praise you. If I have breath in my lungs, I will praise you. I will sing to you. I will shout to you. I will live my life knowing who you are and who I am and what you have for me. So I'm going to invite you to come. Would you, can, would you just come and would you just sing this morning and say, God, make me a new person. Make me a new person. Thank you for watching. I hope you can come back and view future services. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our future videos or live streams. Remember to share this video with somebody and don't forget to join us live every Sunday morning. Blessings.